Hello and welcome to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast, a resilience podcast where we talk about all the challenging things that we're working to overcome like anxiety, health and relationship issues. My name is Sarah. As part of our back to school series, today we're going to be speaking about ways to prepare for back to school to help our children, to help teachers, as well as parents to have a successful year. We're going to focus on stress management as well as improving focus and learning about specific tips that can help neurodivergent learners. Today, we're gonna be speaking with Leslie Gibson, who is an educational kinesiologist. She is focused on trying to give practical tips that can help our children to learn in the best way and to help them be successful no matter what types of challenges they may be facing in the learning environment or through their various learning challenges. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Leslie Gibson. Are you interested in having a published author speak in your classroom or at your community event? I'd be interested in speaking about my new novel, Pendulum by S.E. German, the writing process, mental health, Panda's Pans, podcasting, and more. Contact me at reallifeprojectco at gmail.com for both in-person and online bookings. So welcome, Leslie Gibson, to the podcast. I'm so happy to connect with you today. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to be here. No problem. It's, it's an exciting time. So as we know, we're kind of into the back to school realm. And so we thought we would connect today to talk through some of the strategies that can be used to back to school. But why don't we start with you providing a bit of your background and how you became interested in educational kinesiology? Sure. I've been an education, excuse me, educational kinesiologist for about six years now. And I have been working on that for at least about 15 years. My daughter, who is grown now, was diagnosed with multiple learning challenges when she was in fifth grade. And it set me on the path to finding something that would help her, that would really make a difference. Because we had tried everything that the school system had thrown at us, Um, you know, all of those programs that they have heard really help kids with dyslexia or dysgraphia or ADHD, but nothing was really Mm -hmm. working for her. She was still struggling. And in that search, I came upon educational kinesiology and their foundational program is called brain gym, which has been around for over 40 years now in the educational system. I found a practitioner, uh, took my daughter to her and it really blew my mind the way that just the idea of reading changed everything about her from, you know, her attitude, her um, emotions, like she was just depressed. Her physical body shrunk in on itself at the thought of even touching a book. And that really opened my eyes to the fact that there There's more going on with our kids and even those adults who have these different labels um, than just the basic, it's hard for you to read. You know, there's so much more involved in that. So it really piqued my interest. And when I saw what a difference it made in her, I decided to go through the different courses and become an instructor myself. And since then, I've been um, working with children, adults, teaching and training our local teachers here just to help people understand that when you have one of these labels, one of these, um, you know, whether it's ADHD, OCD, dyslexia, it's more than just in your mind. It affects every aspect of your mind-body system. And educational kinesiology gives us a tool to help relieve that stress to integrate those systems to where it's not such a struggle. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and I'm really glad to see that, um, you know, you were able to find something that would help her so much. That sounds great. Um, and so thinking a little bit about back to school, it can be such a stressful time for kids, um, those with learning issues, especially for sure. What tools can you suggest that would be helpful for these children or even teens um, during that transition time? Well, one of the best tools that I've found to help with stress in general, um, and to some degree, we are all stressed (laughs) these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most of us are walking around in some level of survival. And that's the same for, for our kids, you know, with the uncertainty of, will they be able to stay in school or, um, you know, just what's going on in the world. The best thing that I could suggest to, the most effective tool would be a four-step um, process that we use in educational kinesiology that helps to calm the system, um, to help them focus, and just really gives them a sense of empowerment that they have this little kind of routine that takes a minute and a half that they can use to, you know, calm themselves and to to help them stay better focused. And, and so what um, would be involved in that four step process then? Sure. Um, The first part of that is taking a sip of water. And I know that sounds simple and that we're all aware how important it is to stay hydrated, but just sipping water and holding it in your mouth for a few seconds as you, you know, swish it around like you would mouthwash It helps us to Mm -hmm. instantly feel more hydrated to um, kind of wake up our system. And then, you know, of course, swallow it and it goes into the digestive system. But this is just an instant way to feel more alert, better hydrated, and it allows our brain to function at its best. You know, electricity travels fastest through water. So a sip of Mm -hmm. water. And the second part of that is an acupressure point found under the collarbones, right on each side of the breastbone. So if you imagine just placing your hand on your chest, um, right in the middle to where your thumb and fingers are touching your collarbones, just massage that area. And you can have the kiddos do this for themselves, or if you have a small child as a parent, you can do this for them. Just be careful because there may be some tenderness there. Uh, Some of us do have that. And so just be gentle and it will eventually, um, that will go away. The third part is a whole body movement that allows both hemispheres of the brain to become activated. And that can be um, the knee lifts like we used to do in PE, just where you reach across Mm -hmm. with your hand and touch your opposite knee, or it can be any movement where you're using both sides of the body at the same time. So if you were to touch your fingertips to your thumbs on both hands and just go, you know, index finger, middle finger, all the way across, that is causing neurons to fire in both hemispheres of the brain at the same time. Hmm. And then the last step of that is uh, it's a technique that allows for the body to become calm and centered. And a lot of the the little ones who are stressed and even teenagers, um, this is usually their favorite because it just feels so good. And what you'll do is cross your legs at the ankles and then cross your arms at the wrist and place them on your chest. So just kind of like giving yourself a hug as you have your ankles crossed and just take a few moments and a few deep breaths. And a lot of times this is the movement that people that I work with really gravitate toward. And it, it just helps them to, like I said, just to, to be more calm and to bring things back into focus. So those four things, sipping water, the acupressure points on the chest under the collarbones, uh, moving your whole body and 
crossing the arms and legs and taking a few deep breaths. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. And I really like that. It's very systematic too, in, in how you could use mm-hmm. those. And so I could see that kids and adults alike could kind of use that even during the day. I mean, a lot of times kids have water at their desk, like that is something that they can mm-hmm. kind of draw on right away. So I think that's really great. What other tools might be effective to do at home in preparation for school? So say like, you know, the week before, or even if it's before maybe a stressful test at school or something like that, like, so not quite in the moment, but are there any other things, or maybe these would be great then too, but any other things you would suggest for that preparation time to help lower stress and, and then ultimately improve learning? Yes. Um, those four things are great to do anytime, um, especially during transition. So in the morning when you wake up, they can be done as they're brushing their teeth. Um, if you're transitioning from home to school or school to home, and then at night, if you have trouble sleeping, um, all, it, it really helps anytime during the day. Mm-hmm. But as far as like test anxiety, a great thing that really helps in Not only does it help to calm and focus, but it also helps with memory recall is the what we call the lazy eight in educational kinesiology or brain gym. And it's just an infinity symbol. So if you imagine an infinity symbol in front of you, um, what what you would do or what you would have your kids do is to use a pen or their finger. And they're just going to trace that symbol slowly and follow their fingertip or their pen with their eyes. Okay. Do that three or four times. Make sure they're taking deep breaths and then switch hands and use the other hand. And what this is doing is not only is it activating the hemispheres of the brain, but as we follow our finger or our pen with our eyes, it is pulling us out of that stress response to where we can get ocular lock you know, that staring um, that often happens mm-hmm. when we're under stress, it destresses the eyes and using opposite or using different hands access, accesses different brain hemispheres and really helps with information recall. Okay, that's really interesting. I haven't heard that one before. Um, and so... I'm also thinking of what other things could be used in the classroom to improve focus, either um, that the student can kind of have as their armor, I suppose, when when they know that they're going to struggle with focus, or even that teachers could start to employ. It really will depend on, you know, what it what part of or what aspect of the class it is that they struggle with. Um, Mm. Teachers can use that pace, that four-step system to to begin class and then, you know, integrate that lazy eight into the classroom to where if they know there's, they're about to transition from looking at the board and watching the teacher and listening to their paper, they can do that just on the top of their desk or in the air with their, their Mm -hmm. fingers. And that's one thing that when I introduce that to the classroom, it immediately helps to helps us as adults um, to recognize those children who are really struggling. Um, if I, it, well, for example, I've taught this to some fifth graders right before it was the week before their big test. I went in and was giving them a few tips and I had them doing the lazy eight in the air with their fingers mm-hmm. and the teacher came over to me later and he said, you know, I noticed the ones who had trouble doing that are my students who struggle in the classroom. So using things like this, it gives you a nonverbal way to recognize those kids who might need a little extra help. Um, But you can also use any kind of midline movement. Anything that crosses the midline of the body will help them to stay focused. If they have trouble with their auditory processing, um, as my daughter did, one good thing to do is just massage the ear, um, the outer shell of your ear. So just 
put your thumb inside your ear and gently unroll the outside edges all the way down. This is great to help um, kind of stimulate the vestibular system to where we are able to listen better, listen with both ears. Um, a lot of times in stress, we become one-sided and depending on the dominance of our body parts, like, you know, everyone knows they're right-handed or left-handed. We have dominant parts of our, our whole body. So you have a dominant ear, a dominant eye, a dominant hand, a dominant foot, and a dominant brain hemisphere. And depending on how your, your dominance is, um, it may cause you to struggle or to not be able to access your ability to hear, you know, and pay attention and pick up on those audio, um, audio cues. Um, also, it can help or deter you in being able to verbally communicate in stress. So this is one of the things that I, I look at with the kids that I work with, but um, crossing the midline, whether it's that whole body movement or doing that infinity eight um, really helps with all of these things. That's really helpful. And, and I guess it is difficult to, to be kind of, um, giving advice because so many people have different either learning issues or, you know, you mentioned audio processing as well. I know there's visual processing. That was one that my son struggled with and we did um, visual therapy for. I wrote a book. I'd love for you to check it out. Pendulum by S.E. German is available now. Pendulum is a heartwarming story that follows a young boy who experiences mental health challenges like anxiety, OCD and depression, ADHD and tics following an infection. It turns out he has a little known disorder called PANDAS. The book follows the young boy as he struggles with his health issues as well as regular middle grade issues and it can act as a wonderful catalyst between you and your children to talk about mental health issues and other things that are going on in their life. Pendulum is available online through Amazon Worldwide, Barnes & Noble, the Friesen Press Bookstore, and a number of other online retailers worldwide. And you can check out Chapter 1, the audio version of Pendulum for free on the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast in Episode 64. I hope you enjoy Pendulum by S.E. German and let me know what you think. So I, I know one thing that I'm hearing a lot about in the school system and even at work in workplaces is neurodivergence. And so I wondered if you could kind of explain what is meant by that term for people that um, it's new to them. So for me, um, being neurodivergent just means that you do not think your brain does not work in the same way that we've always thought it should. Um, with both hemispheres talking to each other and being whole brain. Um, neurodivergence is someone who, you know, they do have that maybe audio processing disorder or dysgraphia where they can't look at a board, you know, look at a whiteboard and then transcribe what they see onto their paper. Their brain just works in a different way than ours. And, that doesn't mean that they can't do the things that we do. We just have to figure out how they need the information given to them. Their, their patterns are, their brains are not wired the same way ours are. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, and so I wondered if you had any examples then, you know, you talked about the audio processing one. Any others of, you know, specific things that either help with um, dyslexia or dysgraphia or, um, you know, even ADHD? I can imagine the focus ones that we talked about helping there, but any other specific ones that you want to give? Yeah, um, I can run through a few for you. So if if they have audio processing disorder to where, you know, they don't hear what we think they hear or they can't repeat back to us. Um, the 
movement or the technique that I suggest is that unrolling the ears uh, all the way down both both sides. A lot of kids who have this don't like their ears touched. Um, mm. It's an overstimulation. So just be gentle. If they don't like it, if they don't like you doing it, show them to do it for themselves. And it could just be the earlobes. Just anything that's stimulating those ears is great for auditory issues. Um, for dyslexia, and this one, this one will be a little difficult to explain, but without mm -hmm. a visual. But using that infinity symbol, if you imagine a piece of paper in front of you and you are drawing that infinity, every letter of our alphabet faces one direction or the other, or there are a few that go straight down the middle. So if you, you know, pretend you're, you have a pen in your hand and you're drawing that infinity, when you get to the point to where you would make an A, the shape of an A, you would use the mm -hmm. A in with the infinity to write that letter and then continue. And then to make a B, you would go straight up the middle and then make the B to the right side of that infinity. So what this does is it gives them a kinetic um, representation of what that letter is. I know for my daughter, um, she had trouble picking letters. So if I asked her to write the letter R, she would whisper to herself every letter of the alphabet until she got there and then she could make the R. She couldn't just pick it out of her brain and put it on the paper. And that's because she did not see, and she still does not most times, have a picture in her head. If I ask you, what does an R look like? You have a picture in your head of what it looks like, basically. Mm -hmm. And some children do not. Some adults don't. And they don't realize that everyone else has pictures in their heads. You know, if we read a book, we're kind of watching that movie in our mind as we read through the book. And a lot of people who have dyslexia don't have that. So another way that you can help is to have them write the letter on a piece of paper as you draw it on their back for them. Again, giving them that kinetic, what this feels like in their body. The dysgraphia, the eight is amazing for that also just to um and i like to use it around the eyes so you can have them trace that infinity symbol around each eye and across the nose adhd um, especially in the classroom is just to allow them to move if your mm -hmm. child is adhd you know they have this and they have all this bundled up energy and you're trying to get them to sit down and do homework you're not going to get them to be able to focus on that homework. Um, let them walk around. You know, if it's spelling words and you're wanting them to spell their spelling words, let them walk around in the room or, you know, do jumping jacks or do some kind of physical activity as they're learning and it will stick better. Um, it's very hard for them to focus on one thing and be still. Are there any other ones that you might want to, give advice for because I have them. I'm just, it's hard for me to just pull them out of, out of mm -hmm, the air. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Um, those were the few that I was thinking of, um, you know, dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, audio processing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I know that there are others. Yes. One good thing is, um, and I've, I really noticed this with the kids that I've worked with who've been on the spectrum that okay. They have very little, um, their balance is usually off <laughs> a lot. Um, they have trouble with their balance and a lot of them are, you know, they're in a very heightened sense of survival. And one great thing that helps with that is if you have them lay down on the floor and then you put your hands on the bottom of their feet and gently like rock 
their feet backwards. You'll notice that they don't have, they have very little flexibility in their feet. And that's usually because the tendon guard is engaged, which indicates, um, you know, that high level of survival or stress. So just put your hands on the bottom of their feet and then push their toes toward their shins very, very gently because it's going to be very tight and possibly painful for them. So Mm -hmm. if it is and you're not able to get very much movement, just gently rock them back and forth and it will start to stretch that tendon guard, which helps with their ability to physically stay balanced. But that correlates into their emotional balance also to where in one session working with one of my kiddos, um, he was able to stand on one leg uh, with no help, where at the beginning I had to hold his hips just to get him to cross his legs and have both feet on the floor. And then he was making eye contact with me. He was initiating conversation. And that was all mainly because I was able to disengage that tendon guard and pull him out of that stress. Oh, wow. Okay. I hadn't heard that one either. Very interesting. Um, And so we touched a little bit on this, but what advice, I guess, do you have for teachers that are working to structure their curriculum or their day to try to accommodate various learners? So maybe they have um, a number of these different issues um, presenting in different children in the classroom, maybe even a mix in certain children. How how is it best for them to try to make make their learning the most successful? Probably the one thing that I would recommend without being able to really look at the students and, and see their individual needs, but there's a book mm-hmm. that is amazing. And I think every teacher in this world should have it. And it, what it does is it teaches you how to look at the dominance of the students, which can be a very fun thing to do in class, you know, which hand is your dominant hand. But um, it gives them an assessment of how that student learns and in some cases where they should sit in the classroom. And that book is The Dominance Factor by Carla Hannaford, Dr. Carla Hannaford. Okay, that's really interesting. I hadn't heard of that before. And so, you know, the idea is that certain dominance would maybe be better at the front of the class and and things like that. Exactly. Um, And also, it depends on, you know, their dominant ear. You want them to be sitting to where that ear has access, um, you know, has the most access to the room. So say if you are left ear dominant, then Ideally, you would want them, if you're looking at the classroom, you'd want them to be sitting on that uh, left-hand side so that their left ear encompasses the whole classroom. Um, It's just really, it's a really neat book that gives us insight that, to me, was (laughs) life-changing to understand how, you know, how we function and how we best learn according to the dominance of our body. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, I mean, I know you talked a little bit about your daughter. And so obviously, you have parented through some of these learning challenges, and then sort of dealt with back to school, um, you know, in in those cases as well. And I wondered if you had any advice for parents in how to navigate, you know, parenting um, a child in this way. Um, and then also, I know it usually involves a whole lot of testing and, and things like that. I just wondered if you had any reflections for parents in that regard. Well, the main thing that I, that I really love about educational kinesiology and the brain gym program is that it's meant to be fun. Okay. So Mm -hmm. the more fun you, you make these different activities, whether it's getting dressed for school or doing homework or, you know, it doesn't matter if it has to do with something that is stressful for them, try to make it fun, try to make it a game and Mm -hmm. meet them where they are. You know, they're, they're children. And a lot of times we as adults and especially in the educational system, 
uh, we expect a lot more from them than they're physically or mentally ready to give us. So just meet Mm -hmm. them where they are and be okay with them not being quote normal, uh, which was my biggest struggle with my daughter was understanding that she is the way she is and that there's really, you know, it's not good or bad. It was just understanding that she's not like I am, you know, she, she's different and accepting that. So. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, and you're right, it can be a struggle too, because especially if we learn in a certain way, and then we just kind of what you mentioned before, we think everybody learns in that same way. And so Mm -hmm. you're right, um, being understanding and definitely accepting and then seeking out these kinds of tools that that you've taught us about today. I think um, that's really helpful. So are there any other additional tools or advice that you'd want to mention with the listeners before we wrap up? I actually just thought of something and this is a little out of the box, but if you have a child who is dyslexic and really struggles with their reading, one way that you, or one thing that you can do to really boost their confidence is, and this is going to sound really, like I said, out there, but take their book and turn it upside down and let them try reading upside down. So a lot of times they're able to to instantly read better. I know my daughter was. I have um, nephews and brother-in-laws. It was the same. But usually people who struggle with dyslexia, and not always, but generally um, they are left eye dominant. And we read from left to right, which is the natural direction that our right eye wants to look because the right eye is focused on what is going on on the left and the left eye is focused on what's going on on the right. It's it's an X. So for people who are left eye dominant, they naturally want to read from the right to the left in that backwards Mm. motion. So as you're reading from left to right, that eye is constantly wanting to skip backwards, um, which can cause the, you know, looking at the first letter and guessing Mm -hmm. at a word or, you know, that's why, or in my opinion, that's why it's easier for them to read those big words instead of the little words, because the big words, if you read them backwards, they don't make sense. But those little words, Mm -hmm. some of them, you know, they, they make a word backwards. <laughs> so mm-hmm. yeah, when you flip it upside down, it allows their dominant left eye to move in the direction that it wants to go. Interesting. And so then they'd basically start at the bottom of the page and they'd read mm-hmm. right to left. Okay. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, I haven't heard that one before either. But yeah, no, some of these are are totally new to me. But definitely, um, I can see how how they can be super helpful. So I'm sure our listeners are going to want to find out more about you and the work that you do and, and all of these helpful techniques. What is the best way to do that either online or through social media? Sure. On social media, on Facebook, it is The Healing Instinct. And the, it's the healing underscore instinct is my page. Um, they can okay, find great. me there. And then on the website is the healing instinct.com. All right. And I will be yeah. sure to link up to those in the show notes so that everybody can just kind of click on those and, and find you that way as well. Sure. I do have coming up. I haven't updated my website, but um, I actually have two courses. One is if you are wanting to learn how to create balance in you know, your physical, mental, emotional states for yourself, and this was best for adults. And then if you have kiddos that you're wanting to use some of these things for, I do teach a three-day class and I can teach you how to do this. Okay, that's great. And that's coming up this fall? Yes, um, it will probably be the end of October, 1st of November. Okay, perfect. 
And that would be online. Yes, that would be on my website. Perfect. Okay. Well, I'm sure you'll have people that are excited to learn these techniques. Thank you so much, Leslie, for joining us today. I think, like I said, you've given us so many great tools and tips and um, I just really appreciate your time. Yes. Thank you. I, I love to share this with people and if it helps one person to you know, go about their day in a more relaxed way, learning at their, their best, and you know, that's what I'm here for. Thank you so much to Leslie Gibson today for talking with us all about neurodivergent learners, for giving us wonderful tips to deal with a variety of different challenges, as well as ways that our students can cope in the moment. I really liked the four-step process she brought up. I liked also the lazy eight technique that we talked about. Um, It can be such a challenge to try to support our learners, especially if we don't necessarily learn in the same way. So I love what she is trying to teach through Brain Gym and her educational kinesiology work. Again, if you'd like to hear more from Leslie, you can find her on Facebook, the healing underscore instinct or the healing instinct.com. Have a great week. I'm excited to announce the launch of my author website, www.se-german.com. On this website, you can find out all the information about my publications, focused areas on my novel, Pendulum by S.E. German, where there are questions for parents as you work through the novel with your children, as well as teacher resources that can be used in the classroom. There's also information about the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast and recent press. Please visit www.se-german.com. Thank you for listening to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. Please keep in mind this podcast is not intended to be medical or professional advice. If you are looking for that advice, please seek that out from a professional. If you'd like to hear more from me, you can visit my blog, www.theallergybeast.wordpress.com, or follow me online at Sarah Lady Gluten on Instagram, S A R A L A D Y G L U T E N, or the Facebook page, Sarah Lady Gluten. If you do like the podcast, please consider subscribing so that you will get the podcast update every week and or reviewing the podcast on whatever platform you listen to. Thanks again and have a great week.